I'm uh, so thrilled and delighted and uh, so of uh, course uh, absolute honor to introduce uh, Dr. Amy Walton. Um, she's uh, an SF program director responsible for uh, three major activities uh, including brain research, very hot, uh, earth science research, uh, I forgot another one which is uh, data science research. Um, so all of which I think uh, this audience is uh, very much tuned to. Um, she has a long distinguished career. I, well, I got you know, Amy through writing an essay proposals, right? Uh, but uh, looking at her uh, career, she was um, in fact leading the Earth Science Technology Office for NASA prior to her role at uh, NSF. Uh, she also directed a series of leading research activities at uh, Caltech's uh, Jet uh, Propulsion Laboratory responsible for analysis and management visualization of uh, Earth and space data. So what she's going to share, uh, I think is going to be extremely interesting for, for this audience. Uh, let's thank uh, Amy very much for coming to our community and uh, welcome her onto the stage. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, my pleasure. Thank you for coming. Well, thank you all. I'm very delighted to be here and uh, to finally get to uh, come out to a place that for, for a very long time has been involved in advanced uh, research in the geospatial community. And it's at a time when there's a lot of, I think, tremendous opportunities. And it's marvelous to be with the community that I think can take great advantage of those. So, um, there's a handful of topics I'd like to talk about today. Um, the research landscape is changing rapidly. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about what NSF has and is doing to try and take advantage of that change, some of the programs that are going on. There's a number of research challenges. You know, is it a bug or a feature? Is it a challenge or is it an opportunity? And uh, uh, depending on how you look at it, I think there's an awful lot of opportunities um, and there's some ways of addressing that, but I think a lot of the people who are best able to address that, who have the technologies, will be talking throughout the rest of this workshop. So I'll speak lightly on those. Uh, the things that we're good at back east is the current events in uh, initiatives and um, uh, legislation and things that are going on. And then also there's a couple of activities that I've been involved in that I would like to talk about because I think they have some uh, real possibilities for this, this group. And if you have questions, don't ever hesitate to step in. Okay, take just a little bit of time. The current research landscape, how is it changing? It's becoming much more complex, obviously large quantities of data that we didn't have access to before. Um, bigger questions, um, more complicated models. Um, and what that means is that you then now need to work with a wide variety of disciplines, a lot of experts in a wide variety of fields. So you get an awful lot of team research going on. And then the other key piece is the tools that are being used, is that there is a lot more data, uh, but that involves um, everything from computer architectures to clever networking to advanced software tools to keeping track of the data and its provenance as you move along. Um, that the funding landscape is changing. That's no surprise to anybody here. Um, we're finding that we're getting many more collaborations, obviously among um, not only uh, at NSF, the different organizations, for example, uh, the cyber GIS, GIS activity has been funded both by advanced cyber infrastructure and by the social behavioral and economics organization because it, is a, 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 it cuts across issues in both areas, but it's across different government agencies. There's an awful lot of collaboration going on there. There's a lot of uh, issues addressed there. And there's also a lot of government industry involvement is that I think a lot of the people that uh, work at this organization, um, once the data is available, um, there's a tremendous amount of value added that, that uh, is available. Um, the um, last bullet, uh, you know, diversity has a, mean, a certain meaning to a lot of people. I think what we're finding is that people um, really and truly, that the longest lived cyber infrastructure assets 
are sitting in these chairs facing me, is that you people will be going through a wide variety of editions of software and kinds of computer architectures, and there's, there's an awful lot of those kinds of activities, so a diversity of backgrounds and skills. People who were at one time in anthropology or in computer science are now working in a different area. Um, that I think what we're finding is that our, our, our talent comes from all across the globe and all kinds of disciplinary backgrounds. So if I had to very quickly sum up what are the implications, and for us at NSF that means challenges. The first thing is cooperation. Um, the, the more we work together, the more problems we can solve. That's a little bit tough in an environment where the first person to publish um, gets the most credit, so that's a, um, uh, an area that, that when there gets to be so much to do, um, you can either fight about it or you can work together. Um, but then I think the other three things that we see as challenges are access. How do you find, there's so much data, it's everywhere, it's, can you somehow make uh, secure, uh, capable access to all this data? And uh, the whole issue of sustainability. There's a lot of data coming in. Uh, how do you keep track of the last version, or what did it look like? Uh, you know, what what did it look like under Dodger Stadium uh, a while ago? Um, and then uh, ag again, for us, talent. It's that last bullet. Is that that that's the place that we see through training and through education that there will be the greatest um, possibilities for the future. So I'm gonna take a second and talk a little bit about the foundation, because that's where I work now, and uh, um, just a little bit in the way of statistics on it. $7 billion worth of research every year. Uh, most of it is sent right out the door to grants, contracts, um, and uh, uh, research facilities. Uh, we get about uh, 5,000, excuse me, 50,000 proposals a year and fund about a little over 20% of those. Um, uh, about 2,000 of the 4,200 colleges and universities in the country receive funding from the foundation and you know, several hundred thousand researchers. Everything from uh, graduate and undergraduate fellowships uh, um, and, and international travel activities all the way up to major grants and major um, facility activities. Um, how NSF sees cyber infrastructure. It's both broad and focused. Uh, it's broad in the sense of the various kinds of aspects of the uh, cyber infrastructure along the bottom. The, the four areas are the ones that actually we, we tend to speak of, data, computing, networking, um, and software. But we also, obviously, instruments and lots of them. You know, the, the Antarctic is being rapidly populated with a huge number of high-resolution instruments. Um, we have you know, aircraft instruments, and we don't even begin to talk about all the things that NASA, with its remote sensing, and USGS, with all of its uh, uh, research capabilities, are, are putting into the, the pool. So um, the expertise across a wide variety of students, um, uh, I academic institutions, and also um, a lot of private organizations, uh, a lot of new businesses. There's a, um, a part of the foundation that has realized that a smart um, organization can, is sometimes the, the place that sees the biggest gap earliest. And we get an awful lot of everything from small business innovative research proposals that eventually grow into large companies um, to uh, uh, some cooperative kind of i core um, can you take a, a group and, and, and in a sense, make it into a, a business enterprise, a business capability. So um, where did, do I come from? The Advanced Cyber Infrastructure Organization that's there on the left-hand side, it's sort of, it's toggled actually five different times in and out of the director's office. Uh, uh, and at the moment, we're sitting within the, one of the seven science directorates at the, or, uh, the si computer science organization. It sits there because that's, in a sense, a supply source for a lot of advanced algorithms, security, uh, uh, data analytics, a lot of the foundational research. And then, but we're a little bit different from the, the rest of the computer science organization, those other three columns of information, because those are the places where that kind of advanced networking, hardware, um, uh, algorithms, security research is going on, is that we basically focus on 
um, making those four capabilities that you see down, down the rows of that uh, first column um, available to the community, and it includes a lot of interdisciplinary research, a lot of uh, collaborative research. So I mostly focus on data, which is the top box, and then on Thursday, my colleague Dan Katz will be here giving a talk. Uh, he is from the, um, the folks, heads up the software organization, so if you have questions about some of those activities, uh, and in fact, the um, Cyber GIS is an SI2 uh, software innovation, uh, uh, software investments for sustained innovation uh, uh, activity, and um, he will also be talking about a little more about some of the education activities that I'll be touching on. So that advanced cyber infrastructure piece that we're a piece of, um, two things that we basically are trying to do is to accelerate um, the discovery, and cyber infrastructure seems to be a great way to do that, and then also uh, across all of the different disciplines. It's, I, ha I have to tell you, it's a wonderful job. I get to go up and down the elevator. Uh, it's a 12-story building, and we have uh, the different disciplines are on each floor. Some people never leave their floor, but I get to ride the elevator all the time and get to work with a ver huge variety of people. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a tremendous a opportunity, is that if I had to, you know, there's this, this uh, uh, basically this matrix of, um, is it fundamental research or is it uh, widely used? Is that um, some of our people, the, the big data call for proposals that is doing fundamental research is basically more along the Niels Bohr kind of uh, portion of things where it's fundamental new kinds of things uh, for analyzing and evaluating big data. Ours is, I think, a little more use-oriented kinds of, of research, is that although it, it has a research component to it, it also, you know, again, to be used. It's, in a sense, research infrastructure, um, also infrastructure research, is that what are the ways that you can organize something such that the community can take greatest advantage of it? And then down the side, those seven uh, brown uh, boxes are the different top-level directorates, the various organizations uh, at the foundation that, um, so for example, astronomy is in math and physical sciences, um, obviously uh, EarthCube and a lot of things in the geo community um, are in the geosciences directorate. Okay, and uh, this is, I think, another way of saying here's the four things that we, four areas that we uh, are working in, um, that a lot of the um, NSF high performance computing centers are funded through our organization. Uh, a lot of the research on uh, advanced data capabilities, uh, networking and cybersecurity, and software come through our office. And a little more on each of those in a few minutes. Uh, in terms of um, how much emphasis we place on each of those areas. Obviously, uh, historically, there's been an awful, these large computer centers have been one of the biggest investments that we've been making. But um, obviously, I think data is the fastest growing and probably the biggest opportunity. Um, networking and cybersecurity, obviously, is something that's a growing area of concern because we're tending to start using social science data. That's actually a place where there's been almost a revolution, is that if you stop and think about uh, areas that you might have thought of as, as being sort of um, stayed, for example, before remote sensing, agriculture was considered same old, same old, and yet um, nowadays the way that they use remote sensing and abilities to just very carefully plan how they plant, water, um, which crops they raise. It's been a big change there. The other area that's been sort of a revolution has been in education. There has been, and it's not over yet, that there is so much going on in these massively open online courses and just how do you teach, how do you take advantage of large quantities of data. So there's, um, yeah, anyway, uh, a wide variety of, of topics that we're working on, both nationally and internationally. Um, Switching a little bit here, again, focus of the talk throughout, there really is an opportunity here. There really is a growth, potential growth opportunity, and I actually think that you folks are like two steps ahead. We'll get in that in the last section here, is that um, having been on the, uh, basically the NSF organization that was involved with a cross-agency activity in the BRAIN initiative that NIH, DARPA, and some of these new capabilities, um, it's closer to cyber GIS than you would think. Um, and then the, the far picture is basically a sort of a quick schematic of the neon 
uh, capabilities that in earth science is that there are now all of these instrumented sites. Uh, there's aircraft overflights, there's spacecraft overflights, there's incredibly complex models in everything from hydrology and uh, volcanology. Um, and basically, they're getting global science, um, local policy, um, so in a sense, a wide array, uh, uh, array of cyber infrastructure, questions that they're asking, problems that they're addressing, and kinds of people that are involved. Okay? Um, the models are becoming much more complex. Um, that as there is now an immense amount of remote sensing data available, uh, it's made the models better, and now that the models are better, there's new remote sensing techniques that are being utilized, and what happens is that's an iterative process, and there's a lot of different places that that has made a substantial change, is that the climate modeling is now very, um, it can be, obviously it's gigantic quantities of cyber infrastructure involved, but it can be um, evaluated at much smaller footprints on the, on the face of the Earth. Um, some of the things that are being done with air flows, computational fluid dynamics, there's far less of the sort of the expensive wind tunnel testing that is going on for airplanes, also for automobiles. There's a lot of places where bottling is, is taking over that you don't have to bend iron to, to see if it works as often, is that you can model it first. And then obviously in, in the areas of astrophysics, um, there's just phenomenal quantities of, of, of data that those uh, new uh, potential instruments will be bringing in. One example, August 1st, so just at the start of this month, it got its go-ahead to um, start construction. It's the uh, um, Large Synoptic um, Survey Telescope. It will be in the high desert of Chile, the telescope itself, but there's a whole set of where do you store the data, how do you get it to, and in fact, in the United States, it's the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign that will be the data um, pipe that it goes to, and it does the, um, uh, basically, it, it handles the data overnight. Um, the, <laughs> the issue is that, uh, basically, it, it, um, in 15, it's got a wide field. In 15 seconds, it can cover a huge amount of sky, and it then can process it um, and, and send it out in about five seconds. So it can take a whole series. In a night, it's about 60 terabytes of data. Um, and uh, that, um, that, as you can see, there's a couple of, of links. The National Center for Supercomputing Applications will be one place that it goes, but there's also these DAC, these active archives, that uh, Europe and, and the United States will have. But basically, it's an international astronomy activity. Um, so sort of 60 terabytes a night um, for this, this telescope alone. Um, there's another, um, and it also got an okay recently. This is the one that, this is the um, uh, uh, kilometer array in uh, South Africa, but it'll also eventually go out to New Zealand, and, and basically that's going to put out 700 terabytes a second. And uh, yeah, right, is that in, uh, I think it was January of last year, uh, Chris Matman uh, wrote a short article on that in, uh, in Nature, and his comment was, at that kind of um, quantity of data, it'll, it'll outdo the internet in, it, it'll just, uh, there will be more data from that one uh, telescope uh, uh, array than there will be from the entire internet at the time he was speaking, which was 2013. So it's like, that's a lot of data, so. Anyway, um, I think what I want to do just really briefly is touch on, I'm not going to go through the technology itself, I'm going to touch on these. There's actually some people in the audience that I maybe will point out because I think they will be the ones that in the days and, and in the workshop uh, meetings to come that will be doing some of these activities. But okay, so the four areas. Networking, um, one of the things, so what are we trying to do there? Um, the really underlying issue is a high flow water main going under the s surface of a thirsty street, of, of, a, of a thirsty city, doesn't do the people around it very much good, is that how do you get these high speed pipelines that we currently have running from a couple of uh, universities 
uh, to a wider number of universities and to um, collaborations of universities. And so that's what some of these activities are doing, trying to get them up to that um, 10 or even 100 gigabit uh, rates of flow. Um, we have some international uh, remote sensing that's going on that, that it's at the 100 gig uh, levels, basically. Can we have that pipeline go? And then at the ends, can you have it feed off almost like a network that, you know, from the main stations, you have the express across the oceans, and then can you have additional um, universities and, and organizations feeding at lower rates once it gets across? Obviously, security is a big issue, and there's a couple of major security and networking um, experiments that are going on uh, that it's kind of... It's, it's not the, it has a little less of the DOD flavor to it. It's just, how do I make sure my data is, is you know, it's integrity, it's trustworthy, is, is, is what's being asked. And uh, obviously, throughout, just um, the ability to, to understand um, uh, security, understand designing organ, uh, networks that have less um, vulnerability. So that's my network colleagues. Um, all day long as I'm talking about these things, I'm going to in some ways be the most boring person you ever heard because there's a lot of, of these um, solicitations that are still in the process of being evaluated and awarded and we can't speak to them while they're in the process. So I'm going back a year on this. Um, there's, there's a whole bunch of networking proposals and solicitations being evaluated right now. Last year they made 45 awards to um, the uh, institutions that you see marked there, again, it's how do you, we see the universities as our entree into the rest of society. The students leave and they go and they take these skills with them, they join companies, they form companies, um, that the uh, universities are seen as a center of excellence or a center of advice for the rest of the surrounding community. That's our entree. 2,000 that we fund directly, 40 to 100 of them in the country. So that's, that's kind of the, the strategy for us. Um, so networking. Second area, software. Um, that, that's an area that we've taken a leadership role in simply because, uh, you know, a pile of zeros and ones does you very little good. You sort of need what are the tools to turn it into something, what is the metadata telling you what, what that pile of data represents. Um, what are, you know, what is the provenance of the data? Where did it come from? When did it come from? What did you do to it? Um, what does the workflow pipeline look like? So um, the whole issue of having something that is a useful conglomerate of information um, and, and software has a big part in that. So uh, day after tomorrow, Dan Katz, my colleague, will be here. Um, ACI leads and coordinates this across the entire National Science Foundation. So if you have questions, he will also be an excellent person to ask. A um, couple of examples besides cyber GIS. Um, there's a number of solicitations that come out. Some of them, you know, and they're periodic and recurring. Is that um, if you looked at the cyber infrastructure, uh, the, the software portion of our research, it's sort of small, medium, and large uh, uh, solicitations. Is that we ask for software elements, individual activities that can help solve a problem. Um, something that's a little bit larger um, is the cyber frameworks, and then one of the things that we're looking at funding is cyber institutes, something that's a combination of frameworks and elements. And again, can you start to build a capacity within the country for these kinds of, of, of capabilities? So um, the nice thing about the N NSF website is that if you tie in on any of these, if you come back in a year or two, it will say, gee, that solicitation has now closed, but here's the number on the new one. So you can always track what, what kinds of things are going on for, for the uh, foundation. Um, this is a lagging indicator, but receiving a Nobel Prize for um, something is sort of an indicator of how valuable it is, is as well, is that the 2013 Nobel Prize was won using high-performance computing methods, um, and it's basically now the uh, uh, investigations of chemical and biological, uh, bio, uh, biochemical processes now use this as a standard way of doing things. So again, that, that the, the level, the pack is now running faster is that now all of us are beginning to um, have to have 
these cyber infrastructure capabilities to do our research. So um, this is one example of a software uh, activity um, th that it was basically, can you track um, a storm and then sort of the, the water levels in front of a hurricane? The eponymous slosh model here um, is basically uh, a combination of software tools and the, the innovative thing there was at the time was not only software tools but cloud computing is that when a hurricane is coming in you might have a very uh, detailed model but you may not have a lot of time to decide do we evacuate when do we evacuate when do we have to make that decision so by adding in cloud computing capabilities um, uh, you, you can get a feel for um, you can have the data handled in a, in a meaningful time period. Uh, the image just shows it's the tip of Florida. They took an, and they simulated one case where they'd had a, a hurricane come in. Uh, the uh, water level rose two feet. As you can see, an awful lot of uh, Florida was underwater in a, f in a hurry. But in any case, um, again, using software, using modeling uh, to, in real time, handle data for policy reasons. I'm going to jump to the third area, data, for a second, is that we have um, probably five areas that we're working on. If you start up at the top, closest to me, foundational research, uh, that tends to be things like the big data solicitation, and again, it's things that are, are there new ways to um, uh, deal with data analytics, statistics, for evaluating, you know, when is enough, when is, the, do you have enough data? Um, as you move across the top, that's kind of, that one and the one below it are kind of central to the world that I work in, is that it's um, software cyber infrastructure, seeing what models, what kinds of capabilities work, and um, f for as wide a variety of communities as we can, we don't keep reinventing it. So that's ours over there. Um, obviously, um, throughout, uh, that we're finding a tremendous dearth of talent for being able to speak both the science, the, uh, the discipline science, and the underlying modeling and cybersecurity. So there's a number of education programs that we have put in place, and that's a few slides down. Again, is it, if any of those are of interest to you, those are also traceable over time as well, because they, they're, they're everything from traveling internationally um, to either a meeting or a conference to working internationally with a group that you think is central to, um, you know, if you have an idea and can work on it. And then obviously, you know, what would life be that close to the Washington DC area without having policy issues uh, to, to deal with? So I think these are just words that, that say more about what you saw in the prior chart. So let me just keep going. Um, the big activity that I think you find throughout the foundation now is this whole idea of building blocks. Any of you who've been working with the EarthCube organization, their solicitations show you know, research networks and the other thing is building blocks. Those are the kinds of things that they're, they're, they're receiving proposals for. Is that um, in, in the solicitations that, that, that I've been leading, um, the thing there is, is that it's just across as many disciplines as you can get it. There's sort of two sizes. There's sort of a pilot size um, that you take. Here's something that seems to work for our community, and, and you just make absolutely sure that uh, it does indeed, you know, that, you, you, that these kinds of pilot demonstrations where you get the community involved, and in a sense, you give them the car keys, and you, and you let them really um, drive it, test drive it, and make sure that this is a capability that really works for that community. We're starting to put together these building blocks where this is a kind of, whether it's a library of functions, whether it's a uh, tool set, whether it's a workflow capability, that it seems to be used by um, some uh, of, of the communities. Can it be used by others? And sometimes there's issues, is that you, you use different languages, so your metadata um, looks different. But, but anyway, to try and take a look at that. It's not like we're funding those activities forever. It's not like this is developing a brand new uh, data center that will forever be there. These are, this truly is research infrastructure. Can, um, for a couple of years, let's see if we can, uh, can move this ahead. What are the issues? Because in the next round, we're gonna try to address those issues. So that's kind of what's going on in these, these calls. 
Okay, so we can't talk about the one that's in there now and what's going on, but we can take a step back. What happened in, in FY13? So there's um, some infrastructure activities at the Texas Advanced Computing Center, um, a, a capability to handle large quantities of data for a large number of of researchers, so that was just sort of a, a infrastructure activity. There was a building block call at, at um, in 12 that funded in 13, and there were four activities there that received funding. The first one is trying to deal with that whole um, long tail of research. There's a ton of research that doesn't get into databases, is that how can you uh, bring it in and organize it. So there's uh, uh, the first one is is uh, at NCSA Kent McHenry. Um, I think uh, Carol Song is is here from oh, Wave. Yeah, Purdue University. Um, that's the second one, and it's related to geospatial data analysis. That they're using a capability that's at Purdue, the Hub Zero, which is an open platform. Is that can the community bring in a set of um, uh, tools? Uh, a set of data, and uh, can they share it, can they store it, can they work on it, and uh, it includes both vector and raster geospatial data. I don't know if you wanted to say anything else uh, at the moment, or I guess you have a, a session tomorrow that you're, you're part of, is that right, Carol? Great, thank you. Um, the next one at Johns Hopkins, there's the Sky Server that um, there was the uh, um, All Sky Survey that was done in astronomy, and there were a huge number of tools and workflows that were developed there. Just when data comes raining down on your head from those those uh, you know, capabilities, what do you do with it? How do you handle it? And he's working with a couple of other non-astronomy communities, you know, in bio and places like that. He said, how can you handle and deal with the data? So. Uh, that's the next one, and then the last one is at the uh, Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center, and it's, again, large-scale uh, analytics is one of the things that he's working on there, and he's got a number of communities that he's working with there. Um, there's an international activity, the Research Data Alliance. There's been a couple of workshops going on, but again, it's almost like those of you tied into the Earth community that have done Earth Science Information Partners, and it's a loosely coupled framework for getting people to work together and share their data. It's kind of an international equivalent so that we can start to share our data and capabilities. And then there was a, uh, a big data uh, activity that uh, we jointly funded with the big data people. It's just sort of open flow enabled activities. Can you take and, uh, you know, uh, more efficiently handle these large data sets that are, are flowing through the system. So some examples of some things that were going on last year. Um, uh, there was, and prior to that, and, and it's one that is, I think, becoming, oftentimes you don't know for a couple of years how successful it will be. There's an activity that was funded back in 2009, Data One, and it's basically working with the environmental um, uh, community, uh, at least that's where it started, and uh, now it's got hundreds of collaborators and uh, uh, all across the country, and again, working with a variety of data sets and capabilities, again, this sort of federated uh, involvement uh, uh, that's going on. Um, I'm going to take just a little bit of time because, and now talk about the fourth area, which is computing, and the reason for that is there's a lot of change happening there is that there's a number of computers that have been out there and they're about to go offline and there's a couple of studies that are going on that are just, what do we do next? So um, uh, my uh, uh, colleague that, that couldn't be here today, Irene Qualters, is on that working group, on that committee, uh, but basically it's, um, uh, let me get to that in a second, is that there was, a, there was an advanced computing vision and strategy that was put together in 2012, and basically, um, here's some of the underlying uh, parallelism, uh, computer graphics, chips, whatever we can have to make things happen quickly, real time, uh, uh, make sense, just keep building, testing, deploying, uh, and figure out what works for the community. That's one of those t uh, things that you just keep running those experiments and publishing the results to the community. Um, then also a wide variety of, again, education and workforce programs that are going on is that if you wanted to work with any of these uh, advanced computing activities, there's usually a fair amount of uh, potential for whether it's undergraduates or graduates working with these activities. Um, that. Uh, 
at currently there's a there's a number of like central large computing activities. Uh, it will be no surprise to those of you from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign that Blue Waters is there. Uh, but in any case, there's also uh, facilities at Texas. But I think let's go to the next one because. Um, Last, in, in this past year, there's been a lot that's been happening. For the geosciences community, at the bottom there, there's this new um, capability uh, in Wyoming, the Yellowstone capability. Uh, Blue Waters and, and Stampede are the two new computing systems across um, uh, sort of our academic world. Um, Blue Waters tends to focus on these extremely grand challenge. There's maybe tens of researchers that they work with. Whereas the Stampede, the, the University of Texas at Austin, there will probably be thousands of uh, investigators. Can they work together? Can they store their data? Again, it's, it's more of a, in the future, as you get more and more people online, it's, it's addressing those issues. So, um, uh, I give, but first and foremost, let me take a moment and give a lot of credit, is that at the very end of December, uh, the system was accepted and went into NCSA and a few months later, it was producing cover quality simulations for, this was for the, uh, in, in nature, for the uh, HIV uh, breakthroughs that were going on there. So, um, tremendous turnaround in, in the abilities and that there's application processes, uh, as you can not quite see on this map down in the uh, bottom left hand corner, just a number of different activities going on there. Um, this is a little more information on Stampede, and that's the case where, again, many hundreds of uh, researchers uh, with the projects um, across the, 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 the f different science fields that you see in the center there. Um, I think I better get going here. Um, but what I do want to speak to a little bit is that this is one place where now what? You know. Supercomputing centers are expensive. Um, do we just always want to be building the number one and then 10 minutes later some other organization is now number one? How do we handle dealing with computing and computers in the future? And so um, I, I bring up this website in this strange yellow green color at the bottom simply to let you know that this is the committee. The top two larger names are the chairs of the committee and the, and the science and, uh, folks that are involved working on that, they're sort of, that report, there'll be a draft out in the next month or so, and that's the site that you'll see it at, and there will be some, um, uh, within a few months after that, there will be um, direction to go beyond that for what are we going to do next? Because if you look at the kinds of resources that the foundation has been funding so far, um, it's becoming a much more diverse group of, of, of activities. It's no longer the number one um, computer in the country, that you're starting to see data storage and uh, data intensive kinds of, of capabilities or things for long tail science, so things that would handle large quantities of smaller data sets. And um, uh, so some of them, the ones that are in the darker blue, are also coming offline. So it's like, so now what? Um, and for the people who have large models and large simulations that they're trying to uh, get results from, it's like uh, that's, that's a topic of great interest. So again, in the next month or so, we should see a draft and then uh, a final probably uh, within, within the year. Uh, this is kind of a timeline for the computing is that, you know, the Blue Waters is up and running, doing a great job. These um, capabilities that are at, at Texas, um, do we upgrade? Do we renew? That's going to be a function of seeing how it works with so, ma with so many people using it. Are we? Uh, how's it going? Um, some of the the wider community is the next line. Um, data analytics is the capability that, that we've just funded, and then at some point there's going to be a to be announced solicitation uh, that'll come out. You know, what do we do next? And there will be guidance based on that report. So that's kind of the next step, um, uh, big ticket. I want to take a second on uh, here is that um, one of the other kinds of things that we're fund focusing on is investments in collaboration. Is um, what you see in the upper uh, right hand corner, there's a research um, group. It's, it's basically, I think Harvard's leading it, but there's, there's five different organizations across the country. 
it's basically it's a research uh, and education. Um, uh, can we uh, work together to provide advice to the rest of the community? Again, if there's 2,000 universities we're funding and 4,200 colleges and universities, not everyone will have um, access to the best. Couldn't you have s a, a subset of people that are helping to pass information out? Can you be um, advisors to each other? And so this is one of the experiments that's going on. And here's um, uh, you know, d d d where it's at and some of the things that are going on there. Um, I want to take a second. I think Dan will probably do more because he'll be talking education on Thursday. But the longest lived and most important cyber infrastructure resources are sitting in fabric chairs facing me. Um, there's a lot of, I'm sure, lovely laptops and mobile devices, and they'll be different next week and next month and uh, for the time beyond that. But sitting here, and pr particularly sitting here, this is a community that understands cyber infrastructure and how to, to deal with change and how to make things work together. Um, that that's a key component uh, of, of cyber infrastructure. Talent really is one of our four biggest challenges. And there's, right now, there's a huge table of kinds of LWD, learning and workforce development. But basically, how do you take an undergraduate and provide them training or provide them an experience in cyber infrastructure? How do you... Um, uh, Anyway, rather than taking a lot of time there, because Dan will do it, I'll take one of them. Career, it's more than just learning. These are fairly prestigious. Um, if, if you, as a um, postdoc, uh, a young investigator, have a topic you want to work on, you get three chances to propose. Early in your career, um, they're like 100000 a year for uh, five years uh, to basically do research. They're, they're prestigious activities. There's one, let me do as an example, that we funded it along with uh, two areas of our colleagues in math and physical sciences in astronomy and physics. Um, and our, our polar friends uh, also were funding it because a lot of the instrumentation is down in Antarctica. But it was the whole issue of um, can you take this variety of instruments and look uh, skyward and combine the data sets and re-look. It's the whole issue of um, the bullets on my side are basically the kinds of things we were looking for uh, in advanced cyber infrastructure. Can we get portable software, data tools, look at it and re-look at it so you get the community looking at this data set? And this was the uh, breakthrough that they found that they think that they have found basically the fingerprints of um, uh, the Big Bang. So um, we're very proud of that. But uh, the thing that it really does is now, this was done by someone early in their research um, trajectory um, using a wide variety of high-powered uh, instruments, telescopes, cyber infrastructure, and it sort of points the way that, that we're all in this spaceship together and we can all be astronauts now. Um, that it really is changing the way that science is being done. So. I think I want to take a second and do a couple of, of news, local news. There is a couple of things that are going on. Public access, you'll be shocked to hear this, but public access is becoming a big deal in, in Washington. And there's been two things that happened. In February of last year, that it was mostly focused on publications, but they are looking to make it handle data as well. That public agent, government agencies are supposed to find ways to make their publications widely available. And what they're hoping eventually to make that be the case is you not only go to the publication, but you can go to the data that's behind it. And you can sort of relook at the data. And I think my colleague from USGS is here and is probably deeply involved. I mean, it's, it's a monumental uh, activity because this is the front end of it. It's the publication part. And there was a follow-on piece that came in May and basically making open and machine readable uh, the new default for the government. And so it's interesting, uh, you know, sort of trivial pursuit thing. The National Science Foundation, most of those data sets belong to the universities that develop them. 
So we have a very kind of a different problem than USGS, NASA, and NOAA, where that's USGS, NASA, and NOAA data. Um, and as I've been sitting in some of these data management working groups, uh, they have a, a, a double whammy because sometimes um, there's, for example, I guess it was USGS was talking, there's probably the, the Landsat data and the stream gauge data is the most important to them, but there are tons of other university and commercial kinds of tools and skills that they use, and it's like, so what do we do with those? How do we make those uh, available? Um, and I think uh, Jack was talking a little earlier today. I think an important thing to realize here is just making the data available, even if you include metadata, even if you include provenance, even if you include the software that the person used to develop uh, the, the data into whatever they had in their publication, that's a far cry from being usable, that there's an awful lot of value-added tools and resources which this institution and a lot of institutions and a lot of institutions that don't even exist yet um, can build and develop uh, because there's a lot of data now and it's growing quickly. So that's, um, that's an area to watch because everybody wants lots of data, but um, for, for NSF it's going to be tough because you're going to have to start telling the professors you can't leave the data in your backpack or your top drawer. You have to do something with it. And we have these things called data management plans, which some of you are painfully aware of. But basically, I think those will become more stringent because you, you as a good steward of federal money, have to do something with the data at the end. Not sure what those things are. Stay tuned for more solicitations to try to experiment with that. That's probably where we're heading with that sort of thing. But then I guess the last topic, just I want to do two, two view graphs on that. The brain initiative is that that was an interesting to one to work on. Is that there's there's a lot that's happening uh, this month or this week's Science Magazine DARPA just came up with a new chip that it has you know f uh, five billion um, basically uh, it, it's trying to mimic the brain, uh, but um, there's two phrases you hear all the time when people talk about the brain initiative. One is we want to understand the brain. What do you think the other most common thing is that they want to do? It's they want to map the brain. And so it's like, okay, <laughs> let's go. To, so so what, did, what did NSF do? NSF came up with, here's five things we think would be really good to, that we could do to help understand the brain. So let's start at the top. And, and I think when it's one of those things that Everyone in this room has probably done some of those things. If the first thing is multi-scale integration of the dynamic activity, so what they're thinking is molecule to cell to some substructure of the brain to person to behavior. But anybody who's ever done a stream flow to watershed to, uh, or anybody who's done a regional analysis and moved on has, has done those first uh, that first area. Um, second one, it's creating tools to image, uh, sense, record, and, uh, and we're looking to try and do real-time uh, uh, activities and then develop uh, ways to, and then you look at the end there, visualize, analyze, model, store, and distribute. It just happens to be brain data. It's not lat long, it's some new measurement of, of mapping the brain. Um, next level, modeling the function, sort of how do you use um, the data to come up with meaningful results. Um, and then again, concepts and designs, we're starting to see chips that are very energy efficient, uh, but again, just technologies that measure, but it gets back to the whole cyber infrastructure. So great, so now you have one of these, um, if it's measuring the uh, uh, what's going on in each of these two billion cells of the brain. So it's like, okay, so how do you pull the data off meaningfully? How do you subset it? How do you allocate it? And then the other thing is workforce development. And that's one of those things, I'll bet you they'll be over here talking to you folks because you have the skills that fit most of the things in the bullets that are above 
workforce development. So anyway, it's, it's very nice to be able to sp uh, be here with you today. Um, there's a lot of things that are happening that build on the cyber infrastructure you already have and extend it. And uh, w we need, in so many different areas, what you bring to, the, to these meetings. And I look forward to participating during the rest of it. So thank you very, very much. Thank you so much, Amy. First of all, token of appreciation. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Did, uh, uh, did I eat up my time? Did you need a question? Uh, maybe anything? time for a few questions before the break. Oh, I'm between you and the break. Well, <laughs> okay, okay, okay. You can speak to me at the break. How does that sound? Yeah. Thank you very so, much. So Amy will be uh, around for the entire day. Uh, feel free to corner her. I'm sure she'll be popular, but don't be shy. And she does and manage a lot of uh, And we'll show Dan's picture late in the day in case you want to talk to him. <laughs> and that's right. He'll, he'll, be, he'll be here the day after tomorrow. Thank you yeah. very, very much, everyone. Thank you.